greatness of women's sports. I know we will all do that moving forward. Um, right now, we are going to switch into our Axios Newsmaker Hour. Each day at 2.30, Axios will be taking over the Sport Beach stage for a series of conversations with newsmakers across Can. Today's conversation, moderated by Axios' Sarah Fisher and Carrie Flynn, will examine how technology and media brings athletes, fans, and newsmakers all together. So to kick the hour off, please join me in welcoming the New York Times' president and CEO, Meredith Coppett levin in conversation with Sarah. Come on up. Welcome back, Sarah. <laughs> I know. The music I has us in the mood. I feel like we should dribble. Should this we? A little dribble competition great. at the end. Thank you all so much for joining. We have a jam-packed hour of newsmakers, and we are so lucky to be joined by Meredith copet Levian, the president and CEO of the New York Times, who will be kicking us off today. Meredith, thank you so much for joining. So happy to be here, and props to Stagwell. This is the best setup I've seen yet. It's really incredible. good. I like the basketballs. Same, the colored basketballs are amazing. Um, folks might be wondering why we have the New York Times kicking us off. And the reason is you all bought The Athletic, an all-cash deal for $550 million. But the thing about The Athletic is that it's lost some money. It was losing money. It's losing less now since you've acquired it. When do you expect it to break even? Are you still giving investors the same sort of three-year timeline? So um, first, thanks for having me. Very happy to be here. Very happy to talk about The Athletic. Um, athletic is doing great. We are so, so happy we acquired it. This was, um, when we bought The Athletic, it was a um, subscription business with just under, about a million subscribers. Um, it had been around for six years. And those million subscribers loved the product. The rest of the world of sports fans didn't actually know it existed. So what I tell everyone who asks me about The Athletic is this is not about taking on a business with a million subscribers. This is about the New York Times owning The Athletic is about what is arguably the leading brand and destination in global journalism, making a 10-year bet to build the leading brand in global and destination in global sports journalism. So we have really, really big ambitions here. The Athletic was losing money when we bought it. We were very transparent about the fact it would take us some time to get it on a path to profitability. We are very happy with how it's going so far. Last year, which, and we're a public company, so we report all this publicly. Last year, we exceeded our economic expectations in the in the first year of ownership, and we are just getting started. But why sports? There are so many different types of journalistic entities that you could have invested in. Why sports? Yeah, it, I, I, I'd say two reasons. One, um, sports itself, just as an area of interest, is exploding. There's more kind of value in sports in terms of, of teams and rights than we've seen at any point in, in my lifetime. The, the player stardom has exploded. Um, so players have much more power than they ever have to, to bring fans in. And, and fan interest is at an all-time high and growing. And the New York Times endeavors to be essential every single day in as many ways as possible to curious people everywhere who want to understand the world and engage with their passions. And we thought... Sports is a huge space where we have an effort to cover it for like a general interest audience, but we don't have a giant newsroom that can cover sports in an everyday way for the passionate sports fans of all the major teams and leagues. So that's why The Athletic and why sports is, I can't think of something. It's like chocolate and peanut butter, news and sports. I can't think of a space that is kind of more akin to news in driving daily interest and needing an authoritative, you know, another authoritative property with, you know, really, really strong journalism against a backdrop of lots of, you know, a, an internet where there's lots of speculative 
information and, and you know, I, I, I can't think of a space that needs it more. But just to push back on that for a second. Yeah. When it comes to moving away, not just from general interest, but drilling down and giving sports fans and teams fans passionate niche stuff, the New York Times or the Athletics leadership just announced that you were laying off around 20 people to reorg so that you're not just putting one reporter per each sports team and it's going to be broader. So how does that square with the outset of the ambition yeah. of serving teams? It's a great, great question. So um, when the Athletic was, was founded seven years ago, it, um, it endeavored to cover sort of every major team in the big leagues in the U.S. and English Premier League football. And we basically had, at that point, as it was built up, a reporter on every major team, or at least most of them. I'd say three or four years ago, even before we acquired it, the idea began to shift as fandom got bigger in the ways I described before, and as players became, in some ways, the most interesting story, and as this explosion of value kind of happened around players and leagues and rights, the Athletic began to move even before our ownership to cover stories of, of even greater national interest, and I would say player movement is a great example of that. You might not be a Green Bay Packers fan, but damn, do you care about Aaron Rodgers if you love the NFL? And or the New York Jets. Or, or where did he go, Sarah? You know, you, you're, there's so much interest in Aaron Rodgers. So the, we, we just did what I would describe as a fairly modest, unfortunate, but kind of modest reduction in force. By the way, that was, I think, 18 people on a journalistic staff that's in the neighborhood of 500. But the idea was essentially to double down on stories that are of really wide national interest in sports, and, and Athletic has been on a journey to do that. You actually, you've seen that in our NBA coverage. I'll, I'll you know, be a little on the news here. We actually didn't have, if you can believe this, didn't have a beat reporter on the Heat, didn't have a beat reporter on the Nuggets. Arguably, we, I mean, we've had the biggest audience for our NBA, for NBA Finals coverage, we've ever had. Um, so very, very happy with that. But we're covering it like at more of a level of, you know, what, who is Jokic? What's happening from a national interest standpoint? Why are the Nuggets, why, why do they look so different um, in this, this finals? Why does the New York Times report the athletic separately? Is there a plan, and if so, when is it, to bring the athletic into the New York Times sort of financial reporting ecosystem the way that you have with wire cutter, with games, with cooking, et cetera? Yeah, that's a good question. I would just say the size of the acquisition and candidly, it relates to the size of the acquisition, the size of the bet the Times is making in sports made us feel like that and accounting rules all made us feel like that was the right thing to do was to report it as a segment and at this point, you know, it gives us a chance to say we're taking a company that had, we believe, the right idea for how to do sports journalism in a really modern way, and we are building that into a whole successful media company under the banner of the New York Times, by which I mean successful subscription business, first and most as part of the New York Times bundle. So you buy the New York Times bundle and you get the athletic with it successful advertising business. We are actually, you know, off to a gangbusters start in advertising at The Athletic. It's a green field. They didn't have real digital advertising. They only had podcast advertising before we bought it. And I would say all the ways the New York Times can make money, licensing, subscriptions, advertising, The Athletic partnerships, The Athletic can also make money. And so reporting it as a separate segment allows us to signify really big bet, long-term bet, pay attention to the whole of the economics. Question for you on the economics. A lot of sports subscriptions right now in news, if you think about like an ESPN, rely on live rights. The New York Times does not have any live sports rights. So what makes you think you can grow from a million to significantly bigger than that without paying to distribute the NBA or NFL or et cetera? If I had to boil that down to like one word that's gonna make the athletic different from ESPN or everything else out there, it's the same word that makes the times different than everything else out there, 
So maybe it's three words, scale of reporting. So the Athletic has a journalistic staff of roughly, you know, 450, 500 people who are doing deep reporting on behalf of fans on the biggest teams and leagues and players that those fans care about in the United States. And for now, Premier League football, but you can imagine we've got international ambitions for kind of all of, of European football. We believe the white space in the market, and we, as you can imagine, for an acquisition of this size, we thought really, really hard about this. We think the white space in the market is really authorita a need on the part of fans. There's a lot out there, but for really authoritative, trusted, credible journalism that is reported, and that's what The Athletic um, was doing great when we bought it, and I would say under Times ownership is doing with, you know, kind of more of the momentum of a daily news cycle, with better ability to swarm the big stories as they happen, and think about all the things the Times does really well when a news event is actually unfolding in real time. We're bringing that to The Athletic as well. So the, the, watching a game while using The Athletic and sort of following what's happening that is getting more and more like we help you follow a breaking news event at the Times. In terms of the athletic product itself, we talked about the business product, subscriptions, advertising, licensing. On the editorial side, when you acquired the athletic, there were some podcasts, but not so robust. A lot of podcasts. So a lot yeah, of podcasts. What, is the, what is the editorial product vision for the athletic? Is it one day video? Is it more podcasts? What does that look like? Uh, it's, a great, it's a great question. So what we acquired, we believe, was the preeminent reporting organization for sports journalism in the United States with a big footprint in the UK on football. We want to grow that. We want to, most importantly, I'll say to all the marketers in the room, we want to make people aware it even exists. When we bought The Athletic, the million people who subscribed knew it existed. Very few other people did. We are on a journey. That's why we're here. We're on a journey to change that dramatically. And we are also on, you know, we, we have gone from kind of one reporter on every team to a reporter on every one of the most compelling stories in sports in the leagues we cover every single day. And that's, that's what we're endeavoring to do. Pardon? And it'll be in every format, Sarah. Just like the New York Times is in text and audio and video and multimedia, the athletic is already in some ways in every format, although you know less sort of ambitiously to date than the Times, it will be in every format like the Times is in every format. So speaking of formats, you just rolled out an MYT audio app. Why, and that's for subscribers only, why a separate app? Why not just put ad audio in the app that you already have? Don't you think that would make it easier for consumers? Yeah, so what Sarah's referring to, let me, let me just um, make sure people know what we're talking about. The Times rolled out a destination audio experience where all of our podcasts and podcasts from a number of other places like This American Life are now featured. And it's essentially a curated listening experience. So if you're somebody, one, one of the problems with the broader podcast ecosystem is it's very hard to know what to listen to next. You might have a podcast you love unless you hear about the next thing in its feed, it's really discovery of the next great thing is really hard. That's, that's the first reason we rolled it out. Second reason we rolled it out is we think um, just like there is a huge need for a New York Times app where you can kind of see at the presentation and editing layer how all the news relates to, to you know, each story relates to another story. We think there's an opportunity like that in audio. And there's an opportunity in audio, we believe, for more than just the long form, you know, 60 minute or 15 minute podcast. So what you'll see in the audio app is a lot of experimentation around sort of short things. Um, and what we're doing in that audio app is experimenting. Can we actually have a direct relationship with users around an audio destination? What are they interested in, in addition to sort of full bore podcasts? And how much of our journalism, a lot of what's in the New York Times audio app, by the way, the athletic podcasts are there, 
but a lot of what's there is also journalist read or read by other people's stories that we've written. So we're also experimenting with what if you could just listen to the New York Times every day? We think there is a giant space in the audio market still to be carved, and this is a big experiment on our part to say, is part of the answer a destination where we have a direct relationship? Part of that experiment. And everyone should download it, MYT Audio. MYT Audio in the iTunes store. Part of the um, experimentation I've noticed is not just new formats in terms of you know video versus audio versus text, but also the way you're communicating. In audio, you have the headlines, which is a short yep. podcast. You're starting to experiment with bullets in some of your print reporting. Why are you doing that? Is that an, you know is your research showing that that's what your audience wants? What's the purpose of that? Um, well, the first thing I would say, so Sarah, I think what you're asking me about is there are a number of places where the Times is like making the news easier for people to absorb. I wouldn't say we're just starting to do that. Actually, I've been at the Times 10 years this year, and I think when I was a year in, we put an app out into the world called NYT Now, which was essentially like a summation of the news. It was an early attempt to say, can we give you the news in bullet form? Yes. But that app didn't work. Well, it didn't work as a destination app in and of itself. People didn't want to light New York Times, but what they wanted was to come to the New York Times and at the surface layer, so you're just scrolling through the app, you could actually, just by scrolling through and never click into a story, kind of get a sense of what was going on that day in that moment. And I want to say, by the way, that's a huge part of the value of the New York Times. Even before you click in to the deeply reported story, even in the audio app and also on the athletic for sports news of the day, just scrolling through the presentation layer, you're getting a lot of value of the Times judgment pointing to these are the most important things going on right now. And here's just a little bit of information about them. I would not say that's new. That aspect of just the judgment being the consumer value is fascinating. Can I, can I poke on that yes. for a minute? The internet broke that, right? The internet broke that. For 25 years of the internet, so much of um, what news was, was kind of stories floating around the web. If you don't also pick up the judgment layer, the editing layer, the presentation layer, where people get kind of context and the relative importance of things and how one thing relates to another, or is this news, or is it opinion? When you sever stories, this is true in like all journalism, from the editing layer, the presentation layer, the consumer is really losing something that helps them feel trust and like get the benefit of that authority. And that's why we're building destinations. We have just a few minutes, so two newsy questions for you. One, there was a report out that the New York Times, as well as other news organizations, is talking to AI companies about possible deals in which they're leveraging the New York Times journalism to improve their algorithms. Is that true? And if so, where do those conversations stand? So let me, um, let me give you a step back answer about how we're, we're thinking about AI generally. It is hard not to feel like we are at the dawn of the next chapter of the internet. So that's, that's the first thing I want to say. And the Times, I, I keep saying this to people, the leadership team of the Times, particularly the business leadership, but news, news leadership too, kind of grew up as leaders of, of news organizations, the business of news organizations, in the wake of like what the first wave of the internet did to quality news, and we learned a ton of lessons. So, so let me tell you the three things that we are certain of as we embark on this next, next chapter. The first one, and this is, if I say only one thing on the stage today that anyone takes away, it's this. Journalism, hardcore, serious news journalism, is first, best, and most a human endeavor. It is the act of bearing witness and translating that witness with expertise and judgment for people into understanding, helping them do that for themselves. You cannot put bots on the front lines of Bakhmut in Ukraine to tell you what is happening there and to help you make sense of it. You just can't. So I want to say first and most, the work we do in all five domains, the New York Times, news journalism, the full report, culture, all of that 
sports, shopping advice with wire cutter, cooking, games, that the, the journalism and the content, if you will, is going to be first, best, and most requiring human creators with expertise and judgment. I am delighted at the possibility that tech can help us augment that. It can help us you know, take some of the grunt work out of it. Maybe it can certainly help us run our businesses, business processes more efficiently. It can help us engage you in the next most interesting story, but journalism, first, best, and most human endeavor. Second thing I wanna say, there must be a way in the ecosystem, there must be a way for audiences to come to the destinations I just described to you. If you disintermediate, if you disintermediate serious news journalism or anything else that is done in a quality way in the, on the internet, if you disintermediate the provider from the user, something is broken with trust, and I think we've all seen that movie in this last chapter of the internet. And the third thing to say, which is what you're poking at, is there must be fair value exchange for the content that's already been used and the content that will continue to be used to, be, to train models. So I'll take that as a yes, that you're having conversations. I didn't answer your question. You didn't answer my <laughs> question, but that's okay. Okay, one last quick thing. The New York Times just announced that it has finally, after you know many, many months, struck a deal, you're ask me. Struck a deal <laughs> with uh, its union in a new contract. Um, what did you learn from that experience? Um, ooh. I'll, I'll, I'll say two things. First, um, in every business represented at CAN, I'm guessing that is a creative business, certainly journalism is a creative business, talent is everything, your ability to attract and retain and draw the best out of and motivate human beings to do brilliant creative work is the whole goddamn game. I don't care what business you're in, that's it. I like have learned that lesson in every job I've been in since I was 22 years old, probably actually before that. And this just reinforced that. Um, you know, the Times must be a place where the best journalists in the world and all the disciplines we play in want to come work. The new contract that we have just agreed to, which we feel very, very happy about, not just the agreement, the contract itself. We are very happy with the contract itself gives $100 million more dollars over the life of the contract, more than $100 million more dollars in pay and benefits to journalists. Um, and the Times in sort of digital and print journalism in, in our roots and what we come from is among the best payers in journalism already. And we intend to stay that way. We, you know, we endeavor to hire more journalists, pay them as much more as we can afford to do and run a sustainable business over time. Before we let you go, is there a piece of journalism from The Athletic in sports, since we're at Sports Beach, that you would recommend? So I, I just wanted, there's, there's Meg Linehan, who is the senior soccer um, writer on women's soccer in the audience, and I don't know where her writing partner, Steph Young, is. I just interviewed them, and I want to say we are making, in The Athletic, under the New York Times, a very serious effort. I think this is what the last panel was about, to cover women's sports in a really big way. We do not think that the money that should be in women's sports is there if the media coverage isn't there. So we, are expand we have significantly expanded our coverage. And I would say, read everything Meg and Steph are writing. It's really good. And particularly the stories about money now flowing into women's soccer and what that's going to mean for, for everybody here. You should all be sponsoring women's sports. It's just my plug. Um, and the most subscribed to story on The Athletic this year, do you want to guess? I can't imagine. What is it? I'll shock everybody. Is a story about abuse in Harvard women's hockey program. It's the most subscribed to story on The Athletic this year. It's an unbelievable story. It's so emblematic of the kind of hardcore reporting both The Athletic and The New York Times do. We'll have to check that out. Megan Steph's reporting. Download NYT Audio. I appreciate the value judgment of The New York Times brings to the different uh, audiences. No response on whether or not you're having those conversations with AI companies, but you said that there must be a fair value exchange, which we appreciate. Thank you, Meredith. Love being so much. here. Thank you.
My mic working. We've got another extraordinary CEO on tap today. Again, this whole Newsmaker Hour is about bringing together fans with the best athletes in the world. And there's no one better to describe that than Amy Gann, who is the CEO of OnlyFans. I've had the pleasure of knowing Amy for a little while since she's become CEO, since before she was CEO. And you would not believe some of the things that are happening on OnlyFans. Amy, come on out. Hi. I love your so dress. So good to see Amazing. you. Amy and I were in Brazil a few months ago talking about all things sports and fandom. And one of the things that she said to me was that, Sarah, we have a bunch of pro athletes using OnlyFans. Amy, why do athletes want to be on OnlyFans? They're famous. They can go on Instagram and get a bajillion followers. Why OnlyFans? OnlyFans is a platform that truly allows creators uh, who are also athletes to connect with their fans. It's basically a modern day fan club where you're developing these digital connections. You're able to direct message um, any creator that you're a fan of, that you follow and subscribe to on the platform. And it creates this unique connection that you don't get on other platforms. Um, you're only seeing content from people you subscribe to. We have well over 200 athletes, if not more, on the platform. Um, those are the ones that we're actively working with. Um, a lot of people like you were surprised to know like, oh, there's, there's sports professionals using the platform as it's another way for them to build their community, but also be able to monetize. But these are not athletes doing adult content, right? Like these are athletes that are speaking to fans about what they're eating in a day or how they train. Like walk me through what they're doing on OnlyFans because I think most people think of OnlyFans as adult content, but that's not all it is. Absolutely. So we are an 18 and over platform, so everyone using OnlyFans is an adult. Uh, anyone that's following a sports star might see their training routine, uh, their fitness regimen, uh, nutrition, and also just really behind the scenes of their personal life. Those, you know, very casual, you know, out and about shots, selfies, uh, BTS at the gym. Uh, things that might not be as exciting on other platforms, but when you're truly a fan of someone, uh, it's like if you want to get more, you want to have more of that access. Um, actually, a great example is Alicia Newman, who is an Olympic pole vaulter. She launched on OnlyFans um, during the Olympics and was sharing behind the scenes of the village, her training, um, even the, the walk-on during the, the games. And that, like, that's so exciting. And that's that kind of connection and access that you can't get elsewhere. What are you doing to try to lure more professionals outside of adult content like athletes, like comedians, like artists? Because I think one of the challenges might just be an education problem, making sure people know you can use the platform in this way. Absolutely. Um, well, obviously, we're known for the spicier content, but we also have the sporty content. We have cooking content. We have tons of comedians on the platform. Uh, we're doing a lot with OFTV, which is our free-to-view streaming platform and app. Uh, we have a new show that just debuted there called Rise and Grind. Uh, the debut episode features Chris Cyborg, who's a fighter from Brazil, and it follows her her kind of training or regimen and just gets much more up close and personal. And we have more episodes of that coming out with some pretty impressive athletes in a range of different sports. What is OFTV? Is that like a subscription video, advertising video? Like what is it? Why do you do it? So OFTV is a free to view streaming platform and app available Apple, Android, smart TVs. Uh, all of those great places. And it's become this incredible vehicle for us to share the range of creators that are on the platform. And creators themselves are able to submit content that's all reviewed by us and have a channel on OFTV too. So it helps creators, um, whether they're sports creators, comedian creators, um, whomever, have another way to express themselves. So this is more of a marketing thing than it is like a business venture for OnlyFans. Absolutely. So it really complements the subscription platform of OnlyFans, where with OnlyFans, as everyone knows, all content is behind a subscription paywall. And with OFTV, everything you can, you can view immediately, it's all safe for work content because we are uh, so publicly out there. So let's talk about what you just said, that every piece of content is reviewed 
by a human or it's reviewed by you. I mean, there's hundreds of thousands of videos and hundreds of millions of hours of video that's uploaded to OnlyFans, to OFTV. Like, how do you physically monitor all of that? And also, like, what are your standards? I mean, clearly adult content is now part of that standard. So on OFTV, we have guidelines that creators must follow when it comes to content quality, content uh, which gets shared with them, and all content that we, we manually upload content to OFTV ourselves. So it's all, everything is reviewed by our team. And same with OnlyFans. We're very, very uh, strict when it comes to content modification moderation, uh, which, you know, we've talked about many times, because to us, it's important that anything that's that's getting on your platform, you kind of have that responsibility to make sure that it's it's safe and follows your terms of service. But how do you physically do it? I mean, if these videos are private between me and you, how do you manually review that? So with OnlyFans, the platform itself, we invest in human moderators. We do use some technologies to help us prioritize content, kind of like a pre-check before it goes live. But all content on OnlyFans itself is reviewed by a human, and that includes photos, videos, direct messages, text, uh, really everything. There's nothing happening on that platform that we're not seeing. So how much of your staff then is just people that review content? It must be like massive. So about 80% of our workforce is dedicated to content moderation, support, uh, and that's a number that's continuing to grow as we grow as a business. We will always invest in human-led moderation because it really, there's nothing that replaces that of the human eye. How many people work at OnlyFans? Uh, globally, we have about 1,400. 1,400 people. And I know you likely can't comment on this publicly, but there have been reports that your you know, 2021 revenues were upwards of like 4.8 billion euros, which is astronomical. You know, Meredith from the New York Times, that's a 2 billion US dollar business. So that is an extraordinary margin of having just 1,400 people produce that kind of money. At this point, with this rate of growth, what's next for OnlyFans? Do you just continue to grow like that as a private company? I know at one point we had reported you were having conversations about an IPO. Like, what does that look like? Uh, we're very happy being a privately held business. Uh, we're going to continue growing globally. That's where we met in Rio. Latin America is a massive growth market for us, as well as Australia, Canada. Uh, looking to head at the future, the future is really on that of the creator. Like We're a creator-first business, so we want to provide opportunities for creators to connect with their community, to grow their community, which is why OFTV has been such an important investment for us. Question for you, it's the same one I posed to Meredith, which is you all are right now user-generated content, but a lot of the big platforms that you might compete with, you know, whether they're free ones like YouTube and TikTok, et cetera, they invest in proprietary content, it, whether it be live rights or exclusives. Is OnlyFans gonna get into the business of investing in its own content? Uh, I mean, that's kind of what we're doing with OFTV, actually. So we have a range of original content, which includes the Rise and Grind series I referenced earlier. Uh, we also have one of our marquee shows in real life, which is a kind of an action adventure interview series with some of our bigger known creators. We have a comedy show called LMAOF, which we uh, record and air monthly. And we have, um, actually this one's one of my favorite, our cooking show, This Is Fire, which is a cooking competition show among OnlyFans creators. So the idea is that you're gonna continue just growing out globally, but you're not planning to like spin the company out, merge the company. You wanna just continue to be standalone, privately owned for now. We're very happy with how things are operated, how we're continuing to grow the business, and most importantly, uh, supporting the content creators. So I said about 4.8 billion euros, I think 2021. Like how much bigger is OnlyFans business today versus then? Um, we're, we're still growing, and I think that's what surprises everyone, is they kind of look at the platform and think, oh, that was just, you know, really popular during the pandemic in 2020. But then when you hear figures, when you see, you know, we were, uh, 
number 11 on the FT's fastest growing companies list. And we were, you know, one of the few companies to make it on that list twice, uh, which we made previously. And, th and that just shows the power of the platform and the creators and the creator economy. What is the purpose of you and OnlyFans being here at Cannes? Are you trying to bring in advertising partners? Right now, most of what you do is subscriptions. Correct. So we don't have any advertising on OnlyFans or OFTV, but that's where maybe there's an opportunity for, we haven't had, you know, we're very much about creator and fan connections, but we get asked a lot by different brands and agencies, like, oh, how can I use the platform? Um, is there an opportunity there? In my mind, yes, I think that there's ways to leverage the platform, you know, potentially work with a spokesperson, collaborate with different creators, um, similar to how you make work with creators on other platforms. There's ways to do that across OnlyFans. So this is like sponsored posts, branded posts, as opposed to like someone coming in with an RFP and buying run of sight against OnlyFans video. Yes, we are, we are not going to have any advertising on any of our platforms. Fascinating. And when it comes to the OnlyFans workforce and OnlyFans as a company. Obviously, you're global. You're headquartered in the UK. You're based in the US. Like, what should we be thinking about in terms of OnlyFans' global presence? Are you mostly employee-based here? I know you had a lot of employees in Ukraine at one point. Are they still there? Yes, a lot of our workforce is in Ukraine. That's the content moderation support I was referencing. Our global headquarters is in London. Um, but at the end of the day, we're a global tech company. You can, we all work remotely. You can be anywhere and work, just like we're here today. Let's talk about some of the OnlyFans products. So obviously, you went into OFTV. There's a lot of different ways that a creator can monetize, whether it's DMs or sending private photos, private videos. What else are you considering? Are you thinking about podcasts? Are you thinking about licensing the OF brand? What's next? So we don't want to, you know, over, we're happy to have opportunities for creators to be able to monetize. That's where we want to support. So for example, we launched an integration uh, with Spring and Shopify where creators are able to plug in their stores um, and again, make a, have an additional stream of revenue. So opportunities like that where we can have uh, meaningful collaborations that ultimately support a creator is what we're all about. What's the creator? creator split in terms of what you take and what the creator takes? Uh, it's 80-20. So we have a very simple business model, all in favor of the content creator. Um, they earn 80% of everything they make on the platform. Um, to date, we were founded in 2016. We've paid out over $10 billion in creator over 10 earnings. billion? Correct. With a B. B. That's a B. Uh, just like Beach. Uh, <laughs> and that's something we're proud of. For every dollar we make, creators um, earn four dollars. Very few companies can, you know, really say that. And that's where, you know, I make it a point that we are a creator-first business. Do you have any thoughts on ever changing that ratio? For example, you know, YouTube has 55-45 for video, but Shorts is 45-55. Will you change that equation across products? No. Never. No. Why? Again, it's all about supporting the content creator. We have a very straightforward business model. It helps the creator. We're doing well as a business, so it's not broken. There is a point with OnlyFans where some of the payment providers were a little bit um, skittish around working with you all. Uh, obviously, they want to make sure they're accountable for quality content that's not violating any under-18 pornography rules, et cetera. But then... And as a response to that, you all said, okay, you're going to limit adult content. But then you reversed, and now you let adult content back. Did you have to work with the payment providers to get them back on board? What was it that ultimately allowed you to switch back and make you feel comfortable about it? So when that happened, I wasn't CEO at the time, but I was with the organization as a CMO. And that really goes to show the power of our creator community. I think for that week, it was probably the biggest news story there was. And that's where I've made it a very clear point to embrace our adult content creators, um, you know, have conversations with any third party that may have misconceptions about who we are or what we're about. Because when you look at OnlyFans and the things that we're doing when it comes to content moderation, creator verification, we truly are one of the safest platforms that there is. We what, know, yeah. what do you do for creator verification that others don't? 
uh, we do a lot, where you can't just sign up and start uh, posting content. You have to submit your first and last name, your email address, um, a photo of your ID, a valid government ID, a photo of yourself holding your ID. Uh, and we, all of this is not, uh, it's um, kind of instantly approved. Again, it gets all reviewed by a human because that's where, that's the difference that's made. And there's a lot of times, like for example, we also ask for social media links because we'll go look at your social media to make sure you are who you say you are and you're gonna be you know, posting content that is also in line with our terms of service. What about in countries where pornography is not as embraced or accepted as it is here in the United States? Do you have to work to protect your creators? How does that work? So it's up to each creator to follow the laws of where they may be residing. Okay, and so last question for you then. You had mentioned a few athletes on the platform. Because we're at Sport Beach, give us a few examples of folks that are on OnlyFans that are athletes that you would recommend that we follow. Um, I would say Nico Ali Walsh. He's Muhammad Ali's grandson, uh, and he's uh, kind of an up-and-coming fighter. And we've been supporting him. He'll be on an upcoming episode of Rise and Grind, too. So you can definitely check that out. OK, and in addition to following him, one last quick thing. How are you guys thinking about AI? So I make this joke that our platform is for only humans. Uh, we are, you know, you want to follow a human content creator. You want to engage with human fans. So we are not looking to have any sort of AI uh, characters on the platform. Fascinating. So no animation, nothing like that? Um, not where anything, it, like, again, it's only about human, human-led content. Like if Elmo wanted to create an OnlyFans, would that be possible? I'm not sure he's 18. <laughs> <laughs> great answer. Amy Gann of OnlyFans, thank you so much. Thank you all. It's great to be here. All right, guys, so we still have a few awesome newsmakers who are going to be joining us today. One of the things that we wanted to do is give you a good mix of people, both in media and technology, who are bringing fans together with athletes and doing storytelling around sports. Uh, our next guest has an interesting story when it comes to storytelling around sports, because you might not know this, but his entire company is really built off of the backbone of sports. Jim Bankoff, who is the CEO of Vox Media, started Vox Media when, at the time, it was mostly just SB Nation. How many of y'all are familiar with SB Nation? They're now one of the biggest sports podcast networks in the entire country. In addition to SB Nation, Vox has a plethora of other platforms. They have Vox Media, they have New York Magazine, they have Eater, all of these other things. And they have built all of those things, leveraging some of the stuff that they have learned from SB Nation. I don't see Jim. He looks like he's coming in one second. But let's talk a little bit more about SB Nation while we wait for him. Part of what that also did was it gave Vox Media the authority to explore more in sports. You might have seen Full Swing on Netflix. That is a Vox Media presentation. They are also planning to do more in the sports doc world. And so one of the things we're going to ask about when it comes to Jim is how this has planted the seed for further investments in sports. Also, while we're waiting for Jim, just want to shout out to everyone here at Stagwell Sports Beach Thank you so much for coming. We here at Axios are editorial partners. That means we're going to be producing an hour of programming every single day. So make sure to tune into the schedule. And with that, we have Jim Bankoff of Vox Media. Jim, welcome. Thank you. Jim, while we were waiting for you, I gave everyone the preamble about starting with SB Nation, and now that's grown into a huge thing with Vox Media. But walk us through it in your terms. How did SB Nation go from being that one sort of standalone property to now this massive empire of almost 2,000 people. All right, well, first I have to say hi to my friend Sarah. Hi to all of you. This is great. You're working overtime here and doing a great job. I was on time, but they, th your next speaker is named Jim, too, and they got the Jims confused. Oh, so I'm sorry about here that. Here I am. Anyway, SB Nation, it did start what is now Vox Media, and really there's a consistent through line. SB Nation is built on the power of individual creators. We started it 15 years ago, so they weren't TikTok creators. They were creating in the medium that was there for them, which was blogging, and we built individual communities. So what se separates SB Nation, which is now one of the largest digital media sports properties, what separates it from the other big ones, whether it's ESPN or Yahoo Sports or 
or Bleacher Report, even though it's kind of neck and neck in terms of size, is that it's not just one brand. It is about 300 different individual brands. If you are a Kansas City Chiefs fan, you might know us as Arrowhead Pride. If you are a mixed martial arts fan, you might know us for the MMA Hour. And I can go on and list 300 of them. But when you cum them all together, they become one of the largest sports properties uh, that there is. And so extrapolate that to Vox Media. What Vox Media is really good at is building relevant intellectual property that creates community. You can extrapolate it to The Verge, which is a community of tech enthusiasts. You can extrapolate it to Polygon or Eater or The Cut or The Dodo. I can go on and on, and there's probably a, you know, a good 20 Vox Media brands, but what they all have in common you know, uh, relative to say one brand fits all, we took an approach to become a platform for brands that are relevant to all their particular audiences. And that audience could be a fan of a team or that audience could be someone who loves to dine out. So question for you, how are most people getting that content? Because I mostly think of SB Nation now as like tons and tons of podcasts. But is it just podcasts? Is it video? Is it text? Like where are you focusing? Well, to be a successful scaled media company right now, the answer has to be yes to just about all of the above. You have to walk the, in, in operating a company like ours. You have to find, uh, you have to meet audiences where they're where they are, and you have to be careful about it because you can't spread yourself too thin because you won't be good at it otherwise. But we tend to favor places where we can build direct relationships with audiences, where there's scaled opportunity, where of course we can have a successful business. And yes, podcasting has been a growth area for us in SB Nation, but we're still big on good old fashioned websites as well. And we have an enormous footprint there. We're big on YouTube with our, our secret base community. Um, where we you know, have a, a huge community there. So and That's a SB Nation sports community. It is, it is. Sometimes communities are built around teams. Sometimes they're built around talent. SB Nation is one that is built around talent. Um, at the center of that is a guy named John Boys, who has um, won numerous major awards, has been written up in numerous publications, and you know, he has a huge following. If you don't, if you... If, if you care about sports, even if you don't care about sports and just want to laugh and cry and all the great things that storytelling brings to you, I highly recommend checking out John Boyce's work at Secret Base because you'll, you'll see he tracks people who don't even care about sports. But if you do care about sports, it's a unique take on everything. So sometimes we build around people who have something to say. Sometimes we build around teams. I've noticed that you're starting to do more with sports on streaming. Obviously, you were the team behind Full Swing on Netflix. You have a second season coming out. Is the plan for Vox to get more into sports docs and more into sports streaming, or it's just docs and streaming in general? Well, we, you know, we, have a, we have a division of our company called Vox Media Studios that's been really successful in selling shows to the big streamers. I think the most successful of which is the one that you mentioned. It's called Full Swing. It follows in a behind-the-scenes way golfers on the PGA and live tours. We did it in partnership with the PGA Tour and Netflix, but it's, it's a phenomenon. And we actually, off the back of that phenomenon, built an online companion in a way that, that is um, backed by Mick Ultra called um, Playing Through. And that has become uh, just in a, we only launched it like last month and it's become one of the leading online golf communities in a really short period of time. And so, yes, we do plan on leveraging our expertise. You know, a, a Netflix production like Full Swing is, you know, is a multi-million dollar type of production focused on television. Um, we, can, we can do that kind of range. We can do a YouTube channel range. We can do a podcast channel range. We can do a text-based website range. And so we run the gamut, and we do think that that type of high-end storytelling has its place in the ecosystem, and we'll, you know, we can continue to do that. How is that good for your business? In, in a bunch of different ways. Um, you know, we're a storytelling business. I, I like to think, and you, know, you can't do everything, but what we do is we tell stories to communities of interest, what I, what I call the modern audiences. And we're all modern audiences. Where do we consume content? Well, we consume content on the web. We can consume, we consume content on streaming platforms. And so we want to be there. It has some direct benefits. First of all, it's a profitable business in and of itself. The studios businesses? The studios businesses. But secondly, um, it, um, 
It has ancillary businesses, uh, ancillary opportunities for our business. I mentioned in th that specific example, the, the expertise that we showed to the Mick Ultra brand through Full Swing, they, they were like, can you help us? We're trying to reach golf communities. Can you do that? And literally overnight, we stood up a digital golf community backed by Mick Ultra that has a presence on TikTok, has a presence on Instagram, has a presence on the web, speaks to kind of what I'll call like younger millennial Gen Z audiences who are into the sport and unlocks that opportunity for them. So that's another business opportunity that was created by us really understanding that audience, understanding how to communicate and tell stories to that audience in different ways. And, and Mick Ultra has been a great partner along that ride. Um, you know, a, a different example is building a community of fantasy sports and sports betting in the U.S. I think you all know that sports betting has become a massive industry. Um, and we partnered with DraftKings to do the same thing. We had an expertise in content. They had an expertise in sports betting and daily fantasy. We came together with them to build up what is now literally the largest per com score content area that that gives people who may be interested in daily fantasy or uh, sports betting information about the games, how to bet, but information just about everything that it relates to sports. And, and now that has become a business into itself where we now, DraftKings and we work, partner with other brands who may want to access that audience too. So not only does it generate leads for them, but it's a platform for other marketers who might be interested in those audiences. So, you know, again, back to the same story, standing up communities, using our understanding of digital audiences, our understanding of storytelling to, to engage. Question for you, there have been news companies that have come out and said, we won't engage in sports betting, we won't take sports betting advertising, they don't think it's moral, why do you think it is? Well, first of all, you have to do it responsibly. Um, and, you know, sports betting is, you know, I, 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 don't do much of it, but when I, you know, place a ten, twenty dollar bet, it makes watching the game a lot of fun, you know. And uh, and if you can do it responsibly, I think it's a big part of the experience. And and honestly, we all know it was before digital sports betting happened. It was just being done under the table in in you know, frankly, like not transparent and not healthy ways. And now it's become a regulated industry. And and of course. Along with every time that we promote it, we promote how to do it responsibly, where to go if you need help with sports betting or any sort of addiction. You know, you can say the same thing about a lot of things. Um, and, and, you know, for us, we work with all sorts of brands, and you have to be responsible in how you give those messages around, and, and I think we are. In terms of Vox Media as a whole, I want to talk about just the state of your business, pivoting a little bit from sports. You all took a $100 million investment from Penske Media, which is another huge digital media, privately owned conglomerate. Why did you take that investment? What was the added value to the, you, and why do you think they made the investment? Well, Penske, has, you know, we're about, I don't know, a couple months into it, and Penske has been an amazing partner. Uh, frankly, we had high expectations of the, of the partnership going into it, and they've exceeded the partner uh, expectations. Why? For your, to your point, because they're in a similar adjacent business to we are. We, we don't tend to compete too directly, which is help, helpful, but, we're, but we do operate in media. We're you know, roughly the same size. We struggle with the same types of things. We see opportunity in the same types of things. And that creates ways to help one another and insights. And we have a lot of great investors, whether it's Warner Brothers Discovery, NBC Universal, General Atlantic, Excel Partners. So we have a great list of investors, but they do what we do pretty precisely. And because of that, we can compare notes and help one another out. Jay himself is just an amazing operator. He can operate at a high strategic level. He is also in the weeds on everything. So, you know, he's, he's helpful, frankly, as a, someone that I can confide in, a second set of eyes on our business, and he's just been wonderful. So that, that's gone extraordinarily well. And I think to your point, like they learn from us. We learn from them, and it's been, a, it's been a great partnership so far. And does he sit on your board? Do they get any board seats? Yes, he's on our board of directors, and, you know, we've already had a couple of board meetings. In fact, I had one last week, and, you know, it's just been, it's been great. He's, he's really contributed. So 
So for now, Vox, you've raised this money. What's the long-term plan? Is it to sell the company? Is it to IPO the company? I mean, obviously, the ad market is challenging right now, so I don't know that you would make a move right now, but what's the long-term vision? Yeah, so when we talk about vision, and, and I think this is for the best, other people might argue differently, we, we don't say, like, our vision is to sell the company. We don't think in financial outcomes like that. We think in building value as a company, building value for audiences, building value for marketing partners, building value for employees, and yes, of course, building value for our investors, but that is a result of doing those other things really well. I think, you know, there's an expression that I heard that I agree with that companies, media, good media companies are generally bought, not sold, and so there are other companies like SaaS businesses, for instance, and it's very formulaic. It's like, all right, we get to a certain ARR runway, and then we sell for our certain multiple, and that's and then we go on and do the next one. Like that, that's not how we do it. We we try to build value, and we have. I mean, look at our history. We've you know grown to tremendous heights as one of the leading media companies in the world over the past few years, and we want to continue to do that. I think you know to acknowledge the truth, you're absolutely right. This is what I'll call like a flattish time in the ad markets in particular, and so you know we. I think I think. You know, not to speak for them, but I think Penske saw it as an opportunity to get in at 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 an investment level that would not is not going to be possible in the next few years. Was not possible in the last couple of years. We were grateful and, and happy to work with them. And once the ad market does rebound, I think you'll see like a a pretty quick inflation in in those opportunity. You know, in 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 the company. And but in the meantime, we're just focused on doing great work. Focused on building brands, having success. Our company won its first Pulitzer Prize. Congratulations. Thank you. You know, and for those of you not in the US, I guess it's, it's international, but um, you know, it's, it's the leading prize in journalism. You know, Vox Media's first one. A lot of the accomplishments that you just mentioned, we're signing up new great podcasters like Esther Perel. Um, and you know, we're accomplishing big things every day, every week, every month at Vox Media. And my goal is to strengthen the brands um, and emerge from you know this kind of what I'll call macroeconomic uncertainty in as in a stronger position than ever. And when that happens, do you think conversations? And not all these conversations come from you, by the way. Conversations that come from people who might not even know you, who say that could be a good acquisition target, or I want to invest in that company. Do you think that will ramp up? Absolutely. I mean, again, that's not our goal, but I'm, I'm not going to be coy or cute. Like, that's just the way business works, I think, if you or anything of value. Like, you, you build something of value, and it has a value, and the people who value it will value it accordingly the stronger it becomes. And so that's what we're doing. When it comes to this is a question I asked Meredith, Amy, I'm going to ask it to you as well. When it comes to AI... A lot of news companies that I cover are thinking about it in different ways. Some are going to use AI, they say, to write articles. Some are going to use it to help their back-end business practices. How is Vox Media thinking about leveraging AI, or are you not? We are. We're beginning to. And you know, the short answer I would give to you is how do we use it to what I'll call elevate human creativity, journalism, storytelling, et cetera. How do we allow the, um, the, you know, I'm on Team Human, I always will be, um, but we, we have always as a company used technology to make the creative process stronger, whether it's how do, we, how do we do analytics to help get the content in front of the right audience? How do we make workflow faster for our creators and for our journalists? And AI, I think, will even advance it even further. And so we're always going to use it in service to great human creativity and great journalism, there are going to be what I'll call like menial rote things that probably, you know, the humans who are creators will welcome the machines to give them an assist with so that they can apply their intellectual horsepower, their creativity to make even better things for the audience. The same thing can be said on the advertising side. Um, and then, of course, we're going to make sure that our content is, you know, valued by the platforms that are training on th their their um, LLMs on it, et cetera. So, you know, we're going to make sure. In what way are you having conversations with them about licensing your content? I'm not going to get into any, any conversation, but suffice it to say that it's in everyone's best interest to make sure that um, not only what Vox Media creates, but other major publishers that have been contributing to the canon of knowledge and continue to do so every day, um, that, you know, are both 
discoverable and present and you know, the content's being fairly valued. You talked about your business mostly on the advertising side, but you do have some subscriptions. You have one subscription podcast, two subscription newsletters. You could be a member of Vox Media. Is the plan to one day get much further deep into subscriptions, or do you want to stay mostly advertising-based for the foreseeable future? Well, we already, to your point, we already have um, some really healthy subscription relationships with audiences that translate into good businesses, the biggest of which is New York Magazine product, which has you know, several hundreds of thousands of subscribers. Um, it used to be a magazine, now it's a magazine plus a really big digital subscription business that we're investing in. That's our flagship subscription model. To your point, we have newsletters under subscription. We have podcasts and growing number of podcasts under subscription model. And short answer is yes. We, we want to expand the pie um, of, of revenue streams. Um, I think in an expanding pie, I think that you could expect subscription and direct revenue relationships, we call it consumer revenue, to grow even faster than the advertising side, which we expect over the next few years will continue to grow robustly as well. So what is the business? It's advertising, it's licensing, it's subscriptions, events. Like, what's the breakdown of all of those? You've, you've nailed it pretty well. Advertising is still the biggest. And advertising itself is pretty diverse, too. You think about it. We have robust video advertising, which is you know growing really well. We have robust audio advertising in the podcast market. We have... Uh, a product called Concert, which is a marketplace of premium publishers that has enormous reach that supplements the Vox Media owned and operated and provides a great solution for premium publishers. Um, so even within advertising, there's a breadth of diversity. And then we go on to the other areas that you mentioned. You know, I'm glad you mentioned events. I hope people here um, tune in or, or join us at the Code Conference in September. Got a great lineup. We'll be talking more about that over the course. I think we're ready to announce our first uh, set of speakers, maybe even tomorrow or next week. We'll see. Um, so stay tuned for that. I know. Oh. So he's the CEO that ruins things for the Little comp teaser. department. <laughs> okay, question for you, though. You mentioned concert. At one point, Vox is all in on licensing tech. You had chorus. You had concert. You had all these different things. And then it seems like you pulled a little bit away from the licensing game. Why? I think that's true. It was a fair observation. And a couple reasons. You know, First of all, and when the pandemic hit, it forced us, along with just about every company, to focus on our core. And our core is audience growth, um, the other business lines that we said. Tech, as I said, we've always used technology to advantage ourselves. And we, you know, Chorus is an amazing platform. Um, but when the, when, the, when the pandemic came and we had to retreat, it just became a harder market. It's an entirely different market going out and servicing SaaS clients, one that we were succeeding in, but one that we, you know, we said, all right, if we're going to focus as a company, let's focus on our audience-based businesses. Um, and, you know, it's an amazing team of technologists, many of whom are now shifting their focus to focus on our audience businesses and our advertising and subscription businesses. Oh, my God. We've gotten through a lot yeah, Woo, power round. of business stuff. Let's end with one fun thing while I have you. I know that you guys have cameras rolling for the second season of Full Swing while the PGA and Liv announced a merger. Any fun things you can tease about what we're going to see in that second season when that was announced? I can't get into specifics because... Come on! No, I don't, you know what? I don't want to ruin it for everyone. I don't want to ruin it for our partners in particular. And, you know, um, having said that, you're absolutely right. We, you know, I think Chad Mom, who works for uh, us and is our executive producer, and he really has you know, been doing the heavy lifting and making full swing a reality. Um, you know, he tweeted that cameras were rolling on the day that the Live PGA Tour merger was announced, and they're still rolling. You know, this, this story is far from done. It does not end with, um, with that announcement. As you know, those of you who follow it, it's a very much of a US phenomenon, but there's a lot of drama, and I think not only did we capture it on that day, but we're capturing it every day subsequently, including just some amazing things that have been happening on the golf course, but as always, some things that are happening behind the scenes. So, you know, what, what I love about Full Swing, and you can anticipate in this, in, in second season, is at least when I think of golf, I don't, th I don't think of too much colorful personality, you know, by, I think that golf has always been has a reputation of a little bit of a stuffier, more corporate vibe to it. That is not the case if you watch 
full swing and you see a whole new generation of athletes that are eager to express themselves just like athletes in other sports have come to do. And full swing has become the platform for that um, and now playing through our, our digital community as well. So you can get excited for a lot of good stuff. So suffice to this say, are you having conversations about a third season? Um, you know what, we're happy to debut season two coming at you and, and we'll take it one step at a time. But I, I, I think, you know, not to speak for our partner Netflix or our partner PGA Tour, um, but I think, I think everyone's been extraordinarily pleased with the success in the audience. And I think you can say as long as there are good stories to tell, we'll be there telling them. All right, so maybe a third season. Penske got in because it was a good time. 300 different brands within SB Nation, which launched 15 years ago. That's crazy to think that it's been it that is. long. It is. I've known Jim for a while because we're both DC people. Um, you guys are not afraid to shy away from sports gambling, advertising, and partnerships. Just do it responsibly. And when it comes to AI, you would not let me know if you are having those conversations with AI companies, but you said it's in everyone's best interest to negotiate something. Really good reporter. She's taking notes for her reporting while she's moderating these panels. That's Jim, you are what makes you so great. Thank you, Jim Bankoff. We appreciate it. All right, guys, we have one more CEO, and then we have the president of MSNBC. But we are so, so, so lucky to have Jim Lanzone with us today. He is the CEO of Yahoo. For you all who are not familiar with Jim Lanzone, he used to run CBS Digital. After that, he went to Match Group and ran all of the different properties, you know, Tinder, et cetera, underneath that. He has taken over Yahoo at one of its most pivotal times. They were acquired by Apollo, a global private investment firm. And ever since, Jim has been executing on a vision to remake some of those big brands, including Yahoo Sports. So let's give a big hand to Jim Lanzone. Wow, bringing out the towel. And you're, this I is a marathon for, for Sarah. Yeah. Thank you so much. You we know, appreciate it. right in the middle of, of is it? Is this interview number four for 20 minutes? Jeez. This is interview number four. How are you We're having doing? a good time. How are you? I'm good. Are you okay? How are you? I'm Need okay. some more water? I'm, I'm thriving right now, Jim. Okay. Um, we're so lucky to have you with us, especially because not long ago, I think it was just a few weeks ago, you announced a pretty serious acquisition in a company called Wager in sports betting. Now, I've always known Yahoo Sports to be about fantasy. Does this mean that you guys are going to go full ahead into sports betting? How are you going to manage this acquisition? Well, the company, we've been trying to figure out where and how to play in sports betting. It was definitely part of the thesis when, for those who don't know, we were spun out of Verizon with the name Yahoo, because we also own AOL and all of their properties. Uh, in September of 2021, one of the biggest you know, uh, theses that they had was around the notion of, of sports betting. Apollo, by the way, own, has owned Caesars and Vegas. They currently own the Venetian. So there's a lot of, of gambling in the blood with the private equity firm that owns us. Um, and yeah, it's, it's a, it's a no-brainer conceptually to think about if you're one of the top two fantasy platforms, Yahoo and ESPN, that, that would lend itself very naturally to rolling into sports betting. One of the challenges with that has been the business model in that category. And on top of it, uh, you know, whether or not it could ever be profitable and what that model would look like. And on top of it, it's been a bloodbath of people trying to compete in that space. So should we do it? Yes. How do we do it has been a business question. I always tend to come at things from a product point of view. And Wager is a company that very simply enables peer-to-peer -peer betting. If you think about the history of betting, you know how many bets are made in sports at a casino, at the counter, <laughs> how many are made with your friends? And whether it's fantasy football, fantasy baseball, or March Madness, or any of the things that people come to Yahoo Sports for, Wager was a very natural product progression from what we already do. So, you know, that's why we, we pulled the trigger on that deal. So if I'm somebody who uses Yahoo Sports either for fantasy or I'm reading articles on it, how can I expect sports betting to be physically integrated into that experience? And when will that happen? It will start happening over the next let's call it six to eight months. One of the, we're trying to get as much ready for the, you know, the upcoming football season as possible, but we just, you know, just closed this deal. So timing wise, it may be a challenge. Um, you know, here's the great thing. One of the, one of the challenges in the category for, for sports betting that I've seen and that we've seen is, 
you know, just how much, how many marketing dollars have been thrown at the category. And they're, you know, you've all seen them. You see these TV ads everywhere. You see online ads everywhere. If you're watching SportsCenter or, or the night of, of an NBA game, you know, they're pitching DraftKings. They're pitching all the, all the different sports gambling channels. You know, that's expensive. And the thesis here, and, and others, you know, like Michael at Fanatics, everybody has their own thesis on how they would approach the category. For us, it's, how, you know, it's extremely congruent to think about um, adding the ability to wager, it's not, you know, <laughs> on the game, right there where you're already getting your scores, right? We're one of the top two apps for people reviewing or going to get their news and sports scores. If you're already there for your fantasy team, and you're already there with your friends because community is one of the biggest parts of Yahoo Sports, uh, you know, that we would really integrate it seamlessly. So if we do it right, it actually won't be a huge production from a user point of view. It might be as simple as one button. And what's the sort of revenue upside of this? You're going to take a cut of those transactions or it builds loyalty and you will put a subscription on Yahoo Sports? Like, how do you guys monetize this? I don't think, although maybe that's interesting, sport, because, you know, again, I still think the category is looking for its business model. You know, the, the theory in sports gambling is that the way that the companies will make a profit is through iCasino. So you will go and gamble, and you will ultimately become a profitable company by offering roulette and slot machines and <laughs> blackjack, which is not, not really plan. sports. That's not what you're planning to do with, I, with wager. Yeah. It's, this is the theory so far, so in, in, the, in, the, uh, in the category. So for us, I think the great thing is this is not trying to compete with casinos. This is trying to enable a very seamless and easy way for people to make bets with their friends and, and within their communities. So, so as far as a model goes, that model is transactional. It's not subscription. And then when it comes to how this fits into the overall plan for Yahoo Sports, I know you just hired Ryan Spoon, ESPN veteran, to be managing that. What is the plan for Yahoo Sports? Because we just had Meredith Levy in here from The Athletic, who represents The Athletic on behalf of the New York Times. We have Jim Bankoff with SB Nation. It's a crowded field. What makes you think Yahoo Sports will be able to grow within it? Well, not, not to be cheesy about it, but we, we were born on third base when it comes to competing in the category. Yahoo is already one of the two largest. And I would argue that from a product point of view, it... it the, you know, the, we've not been putting our best foot forward over the last five to ten years. A lot of our talent is, is the talent you now see on ESPN and other places, whether it's Woj on ESPN or Shams on The Athletic. Um, I don't think you have to go spend $500 million in the category if you're Yahoo to, to, make, uh, to be aggressive and compete. You just have to have the desire to do it, which we absolutely do. Ryan, you know, so again, Ryan Spoon, who ran ESPN.com for eight years, was the head of product there, um, and then went to BetMGM, so also great experience there, and then ran, was the COO at SoRare, so in the uh, NFT space. So amazing experience, a great leader, even better person, but the thing that he wanted to know in coming here was how much do we really want to compete? How much do we mean it? And the answer is we absolutely want to go for it. And I don't think that's been the approach. And that's, it's true for Yahoo overall that when it was owned by Verizon, they did a great job with it for, for their aspirations for Verizon as, as a telecom company. But those aren't the decisions that you always would make for the consumer experience, whether it's Yahoo Sports or Yahoo Finance or Yahoo Mail. You know, there are different objectives than I think you would have. What do you mean go for it? Does that mean you're going to put in billions of dollars and resources to acquire smaller sports companies? Like, what does that mean? Well, I always start from the point of view of our, of our user base. And so everything... How big? It's tens of millions of users a month. We're, we're always neck and neck, um, you know, with ESPN and my former platform, CBS, that I ran for a long time. And as an example, you know, we took CBS sports from eighth to you know perennially perennially top three in sports again we 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 you know pick up yahoo sports at number two i think there's a lot we can do we don't we're not playing from behind you know except for one player espn is large and they have a very large cable channel and a lot of sports rights so that's fine um i always start from a product point of view and and i think that there's just a lot of core work that we can do and this is my view across all of yahoo is one of my personal thesis for coming in to the company to run it is huge audience, the products have seen better days, some of the strategies have seen better days. Um, that's an amazing starting point. You know, you can do something with that. 
So we're talking about product transformation, but you mentioned the Wojas and the Shams of the world. What are you going to do to bring talent back to Yahoo Sports after, you know, one could argue it was somewhat neglected under the Verizon ownership? We have to understand, you know, what is your strategy for content? And we still are a great factory and home for great content. I don't think it's smart to boil the ocean when it comes to all content. Maybe if you're ESPN, you're trying to do so much, then you need to. But, you know, news that gets broken in sports, we know this. If Yahoo, if Yahoo Sports breaks that news, it's not generally given attribution five seconds later by everybody else in the category. Um, and that has always been the case. So breaking news is not a priority. It, it's not a priority to own it, you know. Um, adding context to sports to, to, you know, be what Yahoo Sports has always been, which is the trusted guide, you know, you know, for sports users, for their fandom, whether that's news and scores or whether that's, you know, being the, the leader in fantasy, uh, you know, that is the objective. So how does content ac accentuate that and complement that so that you become a more informed sports fan? That's how I think about content. Okay, so Yahoo Sports is one of a few pillars within Yahoo writ large. There's Yahoo Mail, there's Yahoo Finance, Yahoo News, obviously Yahoo Sports. You've said in the past, like, one day, if you build up all these brands, you could maybe spin them out and IPO them individually. Is that still the plan? And if it is, which of those verticals is out ahead on that journey? You know, I watched the last couple of these, and I watched people dodge these questions from you. But, Sarah, I'm not going to do that. Oh, I love <laughs> gonna that. I'm going to answer your question. Yes, please. The answer is all of the above. Oh, my <laughs> God. What a dodge. Because it's not... The strength of the company is absolutely each individual property. If you are as old as I am, then you would remember Yahoo as a portal. And for some people, it still is. But for the vast majority of people, they have an affinity to one of the top two properties in a given vertical. Yahoo Finance is number one. Yahoo Sports is number two. Yahoo News is number one. Email is number two. People have a preference for that product. They're not coming to Yahoo.com just for the ability to get to all of them in one place. But I've run a very big conglomerate before with CBS Interactive, where we didn't just run the CBS brands, but we had CNET, which had been a public company. Sportsline, which became CBS Sports Digital, had been a public company. And you know, we take this, this view that each state conceptually needs to stand on its own. It has its own economy, its own culture, its own competitors. Uh, but if you weave them together thematically, which Yahoo does, um, they could be stronger together than standalone. So I do believe that Yahoo Finance has to compete with the Bloombergs and the CNBCs on its own and the Wall Street Journals. Um, Yahoo Sports competes with, whether it's New York Times or ESPN or CBS Sports. Um, so they have to compete individually. As a business, we do have the con construct where we can spin them out. We could take investment in each of them individually. Um, but I do think that the most likely outcome would be one unified approach, whether that's an IPO or whether, as, as Jim said, companies are bought, not sold. Somebody uh, sees value in that down the road. But we're 18 months or so into being a standalone company for the first time in six years. Prior to that, both Yahoo and AOL were struggling standalone public companies. It's a great moment in time right now to be private and to be able to do the things we need to do to get these things in a great spot value-wise. It also does help that we have a very strong balance sheet compared to most companies. You want to walk us through that balance yeah, sheet? Exactly. How much revenue? What's get the profit? CFO over here. No, we... <laughs> you are very it's, profitable. It's a very profitable though. company. Yes. We have a lot of money on the balance sheet, and we're not making decisions due to financial stressors or having to make a quarter. We can, we can do the right things to get this thing to be able to fulfill its potential, which it's been a long time, you know? Just to clarify something you said about, you know, one day could make sense to IPO. You're, are you talking about the individual brands or the entire thing altogether? I that's think, a big, I think that's for a big an company. I, yeah, I think for an IPO, it would be much more likely to be a standalone, I mean, sorry, one, one company together. And to that end, you know, I don't think that the brands we own today are the, are the only brands we need to own when that happens. You know, we can be aggressive in thinking about what else should come into the portfolio. And I think my team and I have a very clear view on what makes sense and what doesn't. What we're not gonna do is chase traffic, chase clicks, chase you know, engagement and quotes. Um, you know, 
to have whether it's to deliver cheap ads or whether it's to create the appearance of, of success. Like, we want to do this for real. Question for you then. You have a very clear sense, you said, your team, of what would make sense to bring in, make an investment in. Is it not one of those four buckets, meaning finance, news, sports, et cetera? Or is it something that we're not thinking about that Yahoo's not currently in? Both. So What's an example? I'm not giving an example on ones we haven't done yet. Come on. Good question. It's a good question. But, um, but uh, you know, again, just to say that, it won't be traffic for traffic's sake mm -hmm. to say we're ex you know, this big, we have this much volume. It's going to be for going back to the beginning. You know, Yahoo, from its very start 28 years ago, was people's trusted guide through what, you know, they called it the Wild West at the time. And there's a lot in that, I think. And I think where we're strongest, we still do that, right? That is what Yahoo Finance is today. That's why it's number one and why most... Titans of Wall Street still have it as their homepage. It's why it's people's favorite fantasy sports platform. It's why it's number one in news for people. Um, so I think things we do going forward will be much more down that pathway. Um, you know, so I would look at it that way. I would also argue, and Wager is a good example, we've been making acquisitions you know, up against the verticals that we already own. Uh, they've been small so far. We've actually looked at big ones that we haven't done yet. No, I won't tell you what they were, <laughs> but we've... Took we've, it out of my mouth. Yeah, we've, we've kicked tires on, on much larger deals, and I would not... I'd say that it's very likely we'll, we will pull the trigger at some point. Final thing for you. I've asked everyone here about AI, but Yahoo is such a unique asset in that it's so massive. Are you having conversations with these AI companies about them licensing or paying for your content to train their algorithms? Both. So people definitely want access to our content. Um, and, you know, it's even, it's funny, the companies shut down Yahoo Answers before I started as one example <laughs> of things in the past that were probably worth a lot in the AI age. Yes. Will you um, bring it back? Potentially. Is you know, a big, I, you know, I did 10 years in search, so I'd, I'm realistic about where we sit in search, but we're still top three, and I, that's, that's a lot of traffic to work with to try to make a new dent in the universe. Um, on the AI front, you know, I'm not an AI doomsday person. I'm also not someone who thinks it's going to solve every problem. I think it's much more likely to be a co-pilot internally and externally. We, we already launched uh, a few weeks ago in beta AI as a co-pilot in Yahoo Mail. So the second largest email platform already has AI in it as a test right now. We all, by the way, we have test versions of new versions of almost all of our products in the wild. So if you use it enough, you can you'll catch a new version of Yahoo Finance that's, that's out there. I've had some friends find it. Um, so you're telling me that <laughs> the story's already out there. I just have to look hard enough. Well, there, there are versions of these. They're, they're not the final versions. They'll, be, they'll continue to be tweaked. But, you know, I'm a product person. This is a product company, and AI absolutely fits. I mean, it will be a co-pilot for our content creators. It will be a co-pilot for our engineers. And it will certainly be, be one for our users, whether it's email or fantasy players going forward. Jim, so many great learnings here. I love what you said about the business model is traditionally challenge in betting, and you all think that wager is going to change that. We will wait and see when that gets rolled out in six to eight months, peer-to-peer -peer betting. A talent, not as much of a priority in terms of breaking news, but just making sure you provide content around it and context. Very interesting to hear that because it's kind of the opposite around what The Athletic is doing. They're all about original reporting and breaking news. And that if there is to be a large IPO, it might be that all of Yahoo together, although you potentially could IPO each one separately. I, anything you wanted to add? I just saw that mic go up. <laughs> well, I'd say New York Times is rooted and founded in original content. You know, if you look back at Yahoo's history, back to when, again, it, it was the trust of God news, it was as an aggregator. You know, a lot of people here receive a lot of traffic from Yahoo. We do, I think it's important to distinguish, we do both. Original content will be very important to our future. Breaking news will be very important to our future, but it's not the only thing that we do, and it's not the only way that we need to be strong. So I wouldn't call that the priority as I look at content, is what I'd be saying. Not the only priority. I hear you. One fun thing before we let you go. What is going on with AOL, other than that my mom is still using AOL? Is it like a profitable media company? Have you folded it into what you do? What's happening? No, it's standalone. It's a really profitable, very big company. Really so, profitable? What's funny about it is... How much profit so, does AOL make? We don't say because we're private. Of we're private. When we go public, we'll be able to spin, you know, split them out Fair. and tell you. 
Um, but no, very profitable business for the people, you know, it's a legacy business for people who have used it a long time. But like, look, go look at the Comscore top 10. Look how many of those companies were created in the 90s. <laughs> Things change much more slowly and less often, right? The companies that come along to really make a dent in the consumer internet universe happens every three to five years, right? TikTok, ChatGPT. But before that, it was TikTok. What was before that? I mean, Instagram, it's been a while. So I think people are very quick to say, oh, AOL, when AOL probably dwarfs most of the companies in the last 10 years that had people on stage at can that may not even be here anymore. So. I am looking forward to seeing those AOL profit numbers. Jim Lanzone of Yahoo, thank you so much. Thank you all. Uh, our last newsmaker guest needs no introduction. Rashida Jones is the president of MSNBC, which is having an absolutely extraordinary year. Beat Fox in ratings for the first time a couple of weeks ago, which is a huge feat. Rashida, thank you so much for joining. Thank you. We really appreciate it. Some folks might be wondering, why do we have Rashida? This is here for Sports Beach. And I said, you know, MSNBC has grown to be almost a platform for mega fans. You have hosts who drive huge audiences. I think about Jen Psaki repeatedly getting more than a million viewers. I think about Samos Sanders. So Rashida, my question to you is, how are you thinking about news hosts as people who have large fan bases as opposed to just people who have large viewership? So I think you're absolutely right, and thank you for having me. Um, we like to think about what we do as a brand. So, and Jen is a great example of that, where there's a show that she does on Sundays that will regularly get more than a million viewers, more watched than, than many of our competitors. She's got a newsletter uh, that comes out every Saturday. She's got original content on YouTube and on streaming, and, and she writes regularly for our website. So the idea is, how do you take people who are interesting, who are dynamic, who not only have uh, the pedigree of a Jen Psaki, but are also interesting uh, characters, so to speak, and how do you bring their stories to life? And she's a great example of that. So you have her, you have Simone Sanders. One could push back and say, are you just gonna hire old Democratic administration officials every time you want, want to launch a new product? Like, how are you going to branch out with talent outside of just bringing on hyper-political people? Sure, so, so with those two examples, um, they're both very experienced in both uh, campaigns and administration. You can't deny that. But I think what makes them interesting and the reason people come is who they are and what perspective they bring to the conversation. So Jen, yes, she has worked for the administration. She has worked for campaigns. She's got a deeper uh, political perspective than most people. But she's also a mom. She's also a wife. She is also someone who cares about the, the same issues that our audience cares about. Simone is a woman of color from the Midwest who's who brings a young, fresh perspective. And so I think the connection there is less about where they worked and what they did and more about who they are. And I think that's what, what MSNBC viewers see for us. You, you talk about fandom and this idea of connection with our talent, the connection both with each other and then with the audience is I think something that we do uniquely. Let's talk about news of the day. Cable news is in complete disarray right now. Chris Licht sort of being ousted at CNN. Fox having that $757 million defamation suit. MSNBC seems to have sort of slid through without having a big piece of drama hit it. How are you going to be leveraging that heading into 2024? You know, I think for us it's just putting our heads down and doing the work. You know, we've been very consistent. I think about uh, two and a half years ago when I started and I shared with our team, here are the objectives, here's the mission statement um, for, for our businesses. And that hasn't changed. The same focus on breaking news and informed perspective. The same news on growing our, or the same focus on growing our audience. How do we find new eyeballs in new places? Whether it's streaming, whether it's digital, whether um, it's on social media. How do we find new audiences through long form? Like those are the ideals that haven't changed. Those are the the, the goals that haven't changed. And I think for us, it's just putting our heads down and doing the work. The question for you, Fox has Fox Nation, which is where it puts its opinion programming. That's a standalone streaming service. Right. Why don't you have something like that? Why are you doing streaming through Peacock? Well, we're, we are lucky to have Peacock as a partnership, and we try to do a lot of, uh, uh, find a lot of opportunities to do things across the portfolio. For Peacock to only be three years old and grow as fast as it is, and to have kind of um, you know, cousins, so to speak, in the building, it's been an advantage for us. And it's, for us, it's a platform that our content is growing month over month. We just saw the most consumed content in the month of May, and that's something that we're continuing to grow. What drove that, Trump indictment? I think it was a combination of the news cycle, you know, obviously a lot of uh, news in the Trump space, but then it's also, we introduced a few months ago, um, an initiative we call Morning News. And so in the morning, you can see live 
Morning Joe. You can also see Squawk Box. You can also see uh, parts of the Today Show. And I think just being more accessible to more people. What is the strategy for 2024? I have to ask because we reported recently about all the different networks vying for debates, thinking about new products. What should we expect from MSNBC? So one of our big focuses is to find ways to hear from more voters. I think, and we, we talk about this after every election, midterm in general, how do we get to the people in the middle of the country who are not necessarily um, where our offices are and how do we really immerse ourselves into those communities and tell their stories? And so we just announced last week our embed class. Those guys are very excited to get out into the real world, so to speak, and to find those viewers, vo voters, and tell those stories. So that's a big focus for us. And then I would also say just being everywhere. The ecosystem has changed. You guys have covered this a lot. If you go back four years ago and how people were consuming and where people were consuming, it looks different from today. And so as a, a brand where people do come to us and trust us for information, how can I bring that same value in the digital space? Whether it's text publishing, whether it's video, whether it's streaming, whether it's YouTube, all of these places. And so I think for us, how can we channel the value that we have in addition to the linear channel? It's not instead of, because we our linear channel is growing at a time where most other linear channels are, are declining. So we've got to hold that mainstay, but then we've got to appear in a, in everywhere else. What do you mean by growing? Is it just viewership, or you think the revenue behind it is growing too? Well, the revenue will follow the eyeballs. And so viewership is, is growing, engagement is growing. People are watching our channel longer than any other cable news channel on a given day. We've got more people watching on most days, and we're growing at a, a speed that, that I don't think any of us would have expected, especially in a space where you know, all you hear about is it's declining, it's declining, it's declining. The entire ecosystem is declining, but we're bucking that trend. So the entire ecosystem is declining, which leads me to ask, when do you think you're going to be in a point where no longer can you rely on a cable network to be the primary focus of distribution and revenue? And in fact, you'll have to transition into digital. Is that in the next like two years, five years, 10 years? Depending on who you ask, it's tomorrow or it's in 20 years or it never happens. I, you know, I think because we don't know for certain w at what speed that changes, we've kind of we've got to like have multiple plates spinning at the same time, right? We've got to continue to hold on to the cable audience for as long as we can. We've got to invest in digital platforms uh, in a way that is relevant to those audiences and authentic. And that's something we've really tried to focus on. How do we bring our authentic brand to those platforms? And it's both and. You have to do both at the same time. Um, because it, it, there, will, there may be a ceiling where both can live and coexist. There may be where digital overtakes it. And, and so there are lots of projections, but I think as a business leader, my focus has been how do I do both at the same time and kind of prepare for all scenarios. I want to ask you quickly about talent, because you have folks like Steve Kornacki, who's just an incredible data wizard. He's bringing a lot more sports coverage to MSNBC. Yeah. I found that. Is that intentional in bringing more sports to your news coverage, or is it just that people love Steve and so you want to find ways to leverage him? So there are times where sports is news. Um, you see a lot of that on Morning Joe if you watch. They sometimes will lead with Baseball football. all day. Baseball. They're, they're ba big baseball folks. Um, but I think it's, it's leveraging Steve's brand. And again, we get to do this unique thing where under one umbrella, we have our news networks. Oh, by the way, we have a movie studio. Oh, by the way, we have a sports, a, a sports unit. Like, we have all of these things within the ecosystem. And so part of the exercise is how do we take advantage of that? How do we take a talent like a Steve Kornacki, who is, you know, everyone's favorite data guy? Um, how do you take a talent like Rachel Maddow, who is very skilled um, at that deep dive analysis and bring that to other places? And I think, again, it's something that's unique to us because we can do that. You know, this is a place where I can hop on the phone and call the heads of those teams and they're excited to partner with us. Or they can call me and they're excited to get Steve down at the Preakness. And I think it just bolsters who we are and what we do. How are you handling that when talent comes to you like a Maddow and they say, you know, I don't want to just anchor a show. I want my own podcast. I want to do documentaries. I want to do more on Peacock. Like, are you going to be able to carve out a deal like that for every beast person? Or is it more so if you're specialized and sort of highly visible, you're going to get that kind of deal? I think everyone has a different skill set. Everyone has a different talent. You know, I think it's, it's hard to say if you're a Rachel Maddow and you've got an idea for a podcast that it's not something we're gonna to wanna to lean into. And we just premiered um, episode two of her new Deja News podcast today, still ranking high uh, in consumption already. And so the good thing is, for the, for the people where we've gotten creative and, and expanded broadly through the portfolio, they've been successes. We've done the same with Steve. He, d he had a 
podcast last year. He did a special newsletter leading up to the election. So we try to get creative where it makes sense. In terms of the election, like one fun thing, I love watching every year the networks rolling out their new embeds and getting them all trained up. Like this is a little bit of a different election though. I think it's a highly polarized environment. It's a highly polarized news environment where you have candidates who are going to be disparaging towards an outlet like MSNBC. How are you thinking about that in terms of safety and fairness and protecting your reporters? So it's so interesting because I got this question uh, from, from some of the members of that team saying, what can we do to protect your brand when we're out in the world? Members of which team? Of the, the embed, embed team. team. Of the embed team. How, how, can we, how can we essentially stand up for what we do and what you do? And I would go back to something that I started with is, you know, I think their job is to find out what's on the hearts and minds of voters across the world. I, sometimes I think um, people may have a preconceived notion about who we are or what we do, and, and, and I think the, ma- the value of media overall, and I'm way more excited for those guys to get out into the world because that may be part of the story for some people. How they consume news and information in some ways will influence how they vote and how they make decisions, and, and so I think it's a part of the story, but I think we just have to kind of put our heads down and do the work and let the work prove itself. How are you going to do that? Are you putting people on TikTok this campaign? Are you putting people on Snapchat? Like, how are you going to get people to understand the world that way? So it's exactly what you're saying. How can we meet people where they are? How can I bring the content and information that we have to all of the places? If you were to ask my teenagers, um, they don't, I don't think they realize we have cable. I do. I have lots I of cable. I would hope that you do. <laughs> lots of cable in my house, but that's not where they get content. They get it from TikTok. They get it from Snap. And so part of our focus is how do we take kind of the value of our brand, but take it to where people are consuming? You can't, there, there's nothing that I can say that's going to convince a 14-year-old, my 14-year-old my daughter, to turn the television on to watch MSNBC. But you know what she will do? She'll send me a clip of Kornacki and saying, hey, I saw your guy on TikTok. So why not build a show for Kornacki or any of your talent on Snapchat? I mean, that's what NBC News did. Is MSNBC yeah. having those conversations? We're having conversations about how we can continue to find relevance on all of the platforms. But remember, we're a portfolio. And so where NBC News has had a very successful Snapchat, Snapchat show, I think now for nine years, we, we kind of divide and conquer. So if they're playing strongly there, how do I play even strong, even um, um, more effectively in TikTok? Or how do we use YouTube? So, so when you look at the portfolio, we're in all of these places. No one brand has to be everywhere, but we can then really focus our efforts in places where we can have impact. Uh, last question for you as we're kind of getting up on time. There's been a lot of drama around calling elections and whether or not news companies should be playing a role in how that gets called in terms of, you know, whether or not you should call it when some presidential candidates don't want it to be called, how people are dealing with election denialism. How are you planning on dealing with that in 2024 if there's a candidate that refuses to step down? What's MSNBC going to do? So you see in succession. Yes. <laughs> are you trying to say that NBC is merging with Discovery? We're where, where definitely we go there? not. <laughs> um, I'm, that's not what I'm saying. Um, what I would say is, like, there's got to be separation of church and state. And for us, that the, the science behind elections is such a protected class for us. The teams are very separate from the editorial teams. We've got the highest level of standards. If we're not 99.9% sure, we don't make the call. And we've got to be able to do that without fear or favor from anybody, whether it's a candidate, whether it's a party, even the voters. And so we, because it's such a um, important part of what we do, we keep it very protected. We keep it very isolated. We trust the team that we have in that room. And it truly is a quarantine room before we all knew quarantine to mean something different. We protect what they do at such the highest level that we all go in knowing that, that what comes out of that room can be trusted, and we believe in that. CNN has done a Trump town hall. Fox has done a non-live Trump town hall. If Trump came to you and said, we want to do town hall, and obviously that would probably be, be pretty good for ratings, would you do it? So I have a couple thoughts there. One, we're having conversations with all of the candidates across our entire news group about how to bring their point of view to the audience. There are lots of ways to do that, whether it's a live interview, whether it's a tape interview, whether it's a town hall, whether it's a debate. We still have 505 days left until election day. Counting down each day. Not that I'm counting. Um, And I think there are many ways that you can approach that. I don't know that a town hall uh, tomorrow is something that our audience is looking for, any audience. But as you look at the next 505 days, I think you'll see a lot of that across the portfolio. But if Trump came to you specifically and says, I want to be on your air to do it, would you say yes? 
when I say yes to the, it would be a conversation. I think you have to put parameters about how to control the environment. Yeah, totally. Um, one fun thing from you, Rashida, I asked this of Meredith, you know, what's a piece of journalism on your platform that you're particularly proud of that we should all do take a look at? What's an example of that with MSNBC? There's so much that I'm proud of. That's hard to ask mom which baby she loves most. Um, I, think it's, I think it's some of the successes we've had in the audio space. You know, to have Ultra, Rachel Maddow's Ultra uh, come out uh, in, in the fall last year and to be optioned for a movie with Steven Spielberg is pretty impressive. Um, that is not something that happens often in the audio space. You know, Rachel and team um, recently won an award that was not ever given to an audio product. We just launched Deja News to great success. So I actually think the audio spaces and, and the new products that we've launched in the last couple of weeks are ones that I'm very proud of. Incredible. Rashida Jones, thank you so much for joining thank us Thank you today. so much. Awesome. Thank you, my dear. All right, we got one last fun one. This is just two DC people hanging out and talking about Sport Beach. Uh, Mark Penn, we're so grateful that you gave us this platform to talk to newsmakers, break some news today. We've had a lot of really, really interesting conversations and a lot of interesting news that's been broken. But I wanted to just pick your brain as we kick off this Axios happy hour uh, with our partners at Spark and Magnet to talk a little bit about trends. So let's kind of get to it. First off, Sports, as Meredith said, is a trend, right? It's growing. The value of teams is booming as an investment vehicle. It's booming. Fandom is booming. So it makes sense that you all wanted to do Sport Beach. But why is it a strategic fit for Stagwell? Are you guys investing more in sports in your portfolio? Why this? Well, look, I think sports, sports marketing, and fandom really are critical parts and exemplars of how marketing is done today. Right? Marketing isn't just, here's my product, buy it. Right? It is very much a, how do you get this intense feeling about a product? And how do you get people of credibility to endorse and use your product? And what's the power of celebrity? Remember, I think that you've gone now into a world of choice. And you know, if you go back to what I wrote in Microtrends, the paradox of choice is that actually when people have more choice, they make fewer choices. They get what they like. They become more intense about what they like. And they go to Axios every day, day we after hope. day. <laughs> OK, but so let's talk about that. Sports is an opportunity for people to align, you said, with big brands, with big celebrities, with big leagues, with big teams. But it can also be an opportunity, I think, for the teams to figure out which types of brands that they like to align with. How do you advise different sport entities on how to do that? Well, I think that's something I think that's really done case by case, product by product, athlete by athlete. As you know, you could choose the wrong, uh, you could choose the, the wrong influencer these days and wind up in, in soup. So I do think, and we actually have formed a risk and reputation unit, right, to really look into, okay, what are your consumers like? What are your employees like? What, what, what is the whole investor suite? Have you all already looked at your stakeholders? But you know, most stakeholders are unified by sports. And so if I look at what, what remains to be mostly a unifying right, element within society, it's not news, it is sports. But let's, let's talk about that, because I remember at the World Cup, you know, Qatar and Doha not being welcoming to the LGBTQ community, and it forced a lot of brands, a lot of consumers to make decisions about how they were going to show up. So sometimes it can be divisive. Absolutely. How do you address situations like that? Well, and, and that's where I think people, people are just beginning to recognize now that, that when you get into the issues of reputation and sponsorship and political issues, and people can, instead of their sports brain or their commercial brain, can use their political brain, uh, that that could be an issue. So that also tells you that to the extent that people in sports want to be marketable, right, that creating this dividing line between politics, sports, and commercial is pretty critical because once it gets blurred, then that could be great for you if you're a niche product, but it's not very good for you if you're an every person's product and you need to reach 80 or 90% of the population. You're gonna to have to be more careful about that. So let's talk about that. I would argue that for people above the age of 18, or sorry, 21, 
Bud Light is an everybody product. And yet Bud Light chose to take a stance on something political and they have experienced a pretty difficult time as a result of it. Do you think that they did the right thing in partnering with Dylan Mulvaney? And are they handling it well? Um, I have to defer to that because they're, they're on our client list. <laughs> oh my it's gosh, like, the deflections today. And we're in the All right, good, so the, is Kohl's on your client list? One. Is Target? No, all right, no. listen, tell me about Kohl's. Like, how, what do you think right, about these well, other brands? But, all right, but, but I think, in general, the question is, are these kind of conscious decisions that companies are making? Did they really understand the landscape? And I'll go back to what, what I'm saying is, you better have a Democrat and a Republican on your staff, and you better really understand that there is a, that it's a 50-50 country out there when it comes to political issues. And so there are a lot of great ways to broaden your marketing base that don't get you into politics, right? You know, I always tell people when they don't like a phrasing, I say, well, look, there are plenty of words in the dictionary. There are plenty of marketing approaches, right? And, and so finding an approach that broadens your consumer base doesn't put you in the middle of politics, particularly as we enter the single most contentious presidential cycle probably in modern history. This is going to be a, an increasing rather than a decreasing problem. And also because the conservatives now have formed an effective backlash that didn't really exist before. Walk me through that. How have they created that in a way that you think is going to impact brands moving forward? Well, I, I, think, I think it's pretty clear. They're, they're willing now to change products, right, on the basis of politics in a, in, a, in, a, in a counter cycle that they've proven can be quite effective, right? But is this long term? Like, they do a boycott of Target for two days. Like, mom and pop are still going over to Target and buying pajamas. Or do you think that this is just a splash in the pan thing? Uh, it's somewhere in the middle. Really? Like, I, I always say that Americans have about a six month memory. So if you can hand it, so will people move on from six months? Probably, in most cases. But it, it, you know, you do see also there's a media mechanism reinforcing the schism. And, and I think you're seeing kind of a, a correction here in terms of ESG, other policies here, where I think the people are saying, look, there's both sides. You better, you better walk on both sides. Uh, and, and, and if not, we've got a large number of consumers here, unless, and I come back to, if you're a Patagonia or if you're a brand that had politics as part of your brand and as part of your consumer base, you don't really have to worry. If, if you were as far removed from politics as you could imagine and suddenly you step into that, uh, you're, you're going to have to have thought that out pretty carefully or think of some things that really help the society and the community, like making sure that everybody can read a book, you know, like we used to be to the third grades. You know, th that's the kind of thing that still is socially beneficial, will help your corporation, and not gonna get you into wedge issues. You use the word correction, not necessarily backlash. Why use that word? Do you think that we went too far in on the ESG messaging and efforts before? Uh, it's it's. When I use the word correction, it's because I think a lot of companies didn't have balanced consultation. And, and they, they may have had someone from one party as the chief communications officer, may have then not really, before they kind of put out programs, because look, I think it's possible to be completely inclusive, completely uh, a, a, as a brand, but not get into trouble as long as you really have consulted both sides. What's an example of a brand that's done that well? Uh, I, you know, that's a good question, but mo look, most brands have done it well. We're doing an analysis now, it's very interesting. So we're doing an analysis that we're about to publish, right, and hopefully you should go to Harris, try to get the exclusive on this. So we've taken brand IDs and we've said, what's your favorability or corporate reputation among Republicans and Democrats. What are the results? And the results are there is a bunch of companies that are, that are very high with Democrats only. And then if you kind of go down, like Fox News was the single highest brand with Republicans. And then you have these dramatic changes with like Delta 
or, you know, or Target, et cetera. But there are a lot of companies in what I'm calling the sweet spot of plus or minus 10 points that you achieved a really, and yet you're a good brand, you're a modern brand, you know, you're not a backward brand. Uh, and and what, you, what I think is a new zone here of where people are gonna look at this, I mean, we're gonna publish this for the first time, perhaps with you, uh, and, and actually it's fascinating because I just got a look at it yesterday. Uh, and then if you shoot for the plus or minus eight or 10% zone, that is the ideal place you wanna wind up. And that's gonna take really understanding the country in new ways. Wanna ask you something quick since we're here at Can final thought. Obviously all anyone is talking about right now at Can is AI. But this is a community mostly of creatives, people who do human work. That's something we heard about over and over today. Like, at what point do you think that this industry is becoming too obsessed with AI and technology and not focused enough on just what they do best? Well, I, I think that a couple of things on this. Number one, I, I do believe that humans reign supreme. That uh, Theme throughout the day? <laughs> uh, that I, I, I don't worry. AI, when we didn't ask AI, should you do Sport Beach? And I don't think AI would have said, do Sport Beach. So human creativity is number one. But Stagwell in particular, right, believes in the right combination of creativity and technology. And so consequently, we already have in market AI products, as you know, Profit, which writes your news release, sees if, who's gonna cover it favorably, and then writes your pitches and then can do 40 pitches an hour, effective, interesting pitches that might have taken days for somebody to do otherwise. And we are really advanced because look, over 10% of our, of our company's engineers, another 10% is really engineering and digital designers. So we are really applying AI for clients who say how to use AI, for our internal processes, how to speed them up, and in the products that we're offering. So no, I don't think that, that we can be too involved in that. I just think you have to have proper respect for the fact that, as I, as I say to people, hey, where's your driverless car? Okay, it ain't exactly here yet. No, and we were, <laughs> and Elon Musk said it would be here like many years ago. Um, Mark Penn, this is awesome. Thanks for hosting us here at Sport Beach. And as a reminder to everyone on the live stream and everyone here in the audience, we're gonna be doing newsmaker panels with Axios every single day. SAG will have many athletes and celebs all week, so be sure to come back and stay tuned. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Je n'ai pas